Hola eh, a todas y todos los que estén encontrando este mensaje en la botella arrojado al mar. Mi nombre es Roberto Collío, soy el jefe de programación del Festival Internacional de Documentales de Arica, Arica Doc. Eh, y en esta ocasión tengo el agrado de poder presentar eh, esta actividad paralela que hemos preparado para ustedes en esta cuarta edición del festival. Eh, donde hemos podido conversar con una de las realizadoras a las que estamos eh, programando una completa retrospectiva de su trabajo. Y me refiero a la artista, escritora, compositora, investigadora y docente vietnamita eh, Trinh Minh Ha, quien junto a Tiziana Paniza, también eh, docente, investigadora y cineasta nacional muy reconocida, eh, estarán intercambiando eh, reflexiones y pensamientos en torno al cine y quizás otras cosas más. Eh, espero que lo disfruten como, tanto como lo disfrutamos nosotros y también los quiero dejar y, invitados a seguir viendo nuestra programación que con mucho cariño hemos preparado para esta edición del festival. I do not intend to speak about, just speak nearby. <laughs> First of all, ask you about your name, because it's Trin Minha, but your name is Minha. How does people, how, how does your friends call you? Yes, Trin, you know, in, in Asia, uh, like in other parts of the world as well, your last name come first and your first name come last. You know, and this is something people have problem with here, you know, in the US, because they can't turn it around. And so many of the Vietnamese who came, for example, to the US, they shift the order of their name, but I just kept it the same because 
you know, it's also a name is a political act, you know, so. <laughs> So I think uh, that's why I kept it. And um, people who know me call me by my first name, you know, Mingha. And I'm very happy if you can, you can just call me by Mingha. And then Trin is the last name. You know, there is a whole dynasty of Trin people <laughs> in Vietnam. So it's not the, a rare name or anything. Uh, right. So the, the first name is, is what, you, what you would call me by. Yeah. And first of all, um, Thank you for all your inspiring films. And maybe to start, um, a question about starting. Uh, how does a film manifest in you? Uh, how do you re recognize it in you? Uh, does it reveal in the process of research or is it a particular image that you become interested in? Um, or maybe that image uh, triggers uh, the process or, or maybe just a set of chaotic questions? Yes, um, you know, this is a wonderful, um, wonderful question. It comes to me in a very, di in different ways. You know, sometimes it comes first in an image, you know, like with A Tale of Love. I had this image, you know, in the, of a field that is gold, golden with a night background and with the moon and this was the image you know that I brought in the film and that in a way inspired the whole of the film and sometimes it just comes in through a statement by someone whom I encounter but it has to be something that is very strong you know people ask me all the time whether I like my friends in Lebanon said can I go to Lebanon and make a film in Lebanon? And not yet, you know, I'm not like a news person who can go somewhere and cover um, a, a story. Uh, this is not my approach. I have to have something that triggers, you know, something very um, strong, like a, a strong kind of uh, uh, situation in the realm of affect where, you know, you don't know exactly why, but it keeps on staying with you and it haunts you and so this is how it would start you know and then in the process it becomes a film i can't say that it's immediately a film it's just something that triggers something in you and then in the process it's always in the making that a film come together for me it's not before so you can do all the research you want right um and i do that all the time but i consider them as uh, part of something that um, that is like an environment for you, but it's nothing that would trigger the film. You know, um, research are just there, you know, for your for your knowledge, but knowledge doesn't bring anything unless you do something with it. You know, so um, so this is how in the process it becomes a film, and of course the process that I follow is um, a, a multiplicity of elements so i never i never come in first with the image or first for example with a, with the text that is written or the statement or the commentary um, or first with a the music these you know are elements that come in the process so you have raw footage you have a lot of music that are made with you know, with that raw footage in mind, but that is not in any way submitted to this uh, footage. So it's not there to illustrate anything. It's just music. And then you have texts, you know, that are, that came up very situated, you know, in the situation of that film, because I write before uh, and then during the process of shooting, during the process of editing. So. There are several stages, you know, of the, the writing that come together. And with when you come to the editing table, all of this come together in a way that is unexpected to yourself. You know, so if it is unexpected to myself, it is also unexpected to the viewer. I understand these materials that you describe as many things, images, sounds, uh, related to the place uh, where, where you are filming. Uh, but of course it's you uh, collecting them and looking uh, to place them uh, in the editing. 
what is the relation between materials in film practice and subjectivity? For me, when I start on something, you know, I don't know before I start a film, but once I start on something, that thing grows all the time with the film. So the dimension of whatever you start with takes on other dimension, other reflexive, you know, dimension, and one speak the other and so on. So it becomes like a multiplicity, but that multiplicity is not entirely chaotic. You know, mm -hmm. actually it's very rigorous. And I think that's the difference with a situation where I think at first people who were, who look at my, um, you know, my earlier film, they were so puzzled by it that they, they say, but then uh, if you go to San Francisco, you can make a, exactly the same film, right? Because there's no order, there's nothing. And I told them, yes, I can make a film in San Francisco, but it would be totally different. Yep. You know, because it's San Francisco. It's, you start with something in San Francisco and it would grow, it would take on dimension that are, you know, that are very related to, uh, to one another without you being the center of it. And I think that's the, the big difference between what people call essayistic films of other filmmakers and the kind of film that I make because I'm not at the center of everything. I'm like an empty center, you know, where things gathered around me and they speak to one another and so on. But it's not a kind of centered subjectivity, you know, um, an individualist subjectivity like people usually think of when they think of subjective films. Here, you know, the films are really uh, the materials that comes to you when you are shooting. And most of the time, these are not dramatic, um, you know, dramatic actions or dramatic situations. They are ordinary life. But how do you receive ordinary life? That makes all the difference, right? Reality is delicate. My irreality and imagination are otherwise dull. The habit of imposing a meaning to every single sign. <laughs> She kept it in diverse places. At the end of the stick she used to dig the ground with, for example. First create needs, then health. Sitting underneath the thatch roof, which projects well beyond the front wall of his newly built house, a Peace Corps volunteer nods at several villagers who stop by to chat with him. While they stoop down beside him and start talking, he smiles blankly, a pair of headphones over his ears and a Walkman Sony cassette player in his lap. I teach the women how to grow vegetables in their yard. This will allow them to have an income, he says, and hesitates before he concludes. I am not always successful but it's the first time this has been introduced into the village. It's the first time this has been introduced into the village. Woman is depicted as the one who possessed the fire. Only she knew how to make fire.
in almost all your films, and especially in Rinse and Blush, Naked Spaces, and others, uh, one can feel like a strong presence of you filming in that territory, like a special energy, even though you're not in camera. Um, but when do you feel that you can start filming in a certain place? When do you think that is the right time to film, uh, that you're really there to begin? Um, <laughs> again, you know, it's, it's such a wonderful question. Uh, the kind of question that I usually don't get, you know, because because <laughs> people don't don't are not so interested, like in the not the origins, but let's say the very first, you know, moments. And I think first moments are wonderful. Um, it it really is very inspiring. Um, I think yes, in in uh, in in many ways, you know, um, when you when you go to a place, you know that the conventional attitude in documentary is you do research and you come in and you film the subject and so on. Um, in my case, it's, uh, as I said, you know, I don't have a preconceived idea. I come in and I'm trying to tune in with people's everyday life, whether that life is inside the house or outside in the street, you know, you are tuning in with it. So you start seeing things that you consider to be very unique to that culture, which is very different from trying to uh, have an overview, you know, and then come in and try to illustrate the idea or the concept that you have. Here you are coming in, you are tuning in with them. So I would not, um, you know, people usually avoid uh, showing too much of themselves because the filmmaker should not loom larger than the subject. Um, this is something that anthropologists are fearful of, you know, but um, without having to loom larger than your subject. And in my case, as I explained earlier, since you don't have like a center that you pull everything in, you are actually uh, tuning in with everything around you. Um, since you are in that kind of position, most of the time you come in quite empty handed. You know, you don't bring in something uh, uh, that needs to be illustrated or that you are fearful that you are not going to be able to bring out whatever happened, you know, um, if it strikes you, it becomes something very charged. And so I would just tune in with the space around me, you know, like I would be in women's space for a while. We can talk, we can do everything. And when I feel that they are quite at ease with me in that you know, in that space, then I start filming. But that doesn't mean that they are not looking at the camera or that they are not conscious of the camera. On the contrary, I think that um, one has to be conscious that there is this element, you know, this camera is the, that is there and then this presence of the person filming that is there. I think that is the reflexive dimension that I brought out in the film. So my films are not trying to erase the presence of the filmmaker so as to bring out the subject, but rather it's an encounter between the two. And so the two are always interacting with one another and through the camera, you know, so the camera becomes like a third presence that is very strong, that enables our, you know, interaction. In this sense, um, sometimes in your films uh, shot in Vietnam or in Japan, uh, the images reflect that you are in this state of immersion that, that, that you have mentioned. Uh, even further, it seems that there is no editing between the shots, but rather a decision of leaving the images like in-camera editing. Um, so maybe again, this idea of being in a conscious presence while filming. Um, so is it possible to refer to this or it belongs to the territory of the unspeakable? <laughs> you know, there are so many things that are, I think, unspeakable and yet very important, right? Uh, we can go near it, you know, and we can go around it and so on. And the way that we speak is a way of speaking around it. There, there's these, um, uh, these so many things that are unexplainable. 
that you can you cannot flatten out with a rational or with a logic. It just how it comes in and how it interacts despite you. You know that that is very important. But I think the point that you make about um, you can feel, for example, some someone's energy, or you can feel someone in the in the shot, but at that moment and the editing that is going on in the camera itself. Um, I think this is very perceptive, you know, because I think that um, whenever I shoot, you know, since you, are, you don't have a preconceived idea and preconceived thought of what you have to do, when I shoot, I'm totally in that moment, you know, so whatever happened to me or whatever happened in front of me uh, is something that develops uh, without my control, you know, and so that's why very often in my films, like in uh, Naked Space, Living is Round, um, you know, you have these long shots and you have these sh shots that are shot and uh, that are short, for example, but most of the time, you know, I can do two, three takes uh, at the maximum. I don't do, you know, until the, la the few last films, when I work in the realm of the digital, it's very different from analog film. In analog film, I only take two, three takes, but I always choose the first one. Because the first one, you know, show your hesitation, how your body react and it, it translate in the image, it's in the hesitation of the image. Everything is in that first moment, you know. Um, so even though I have more control, <laughs> moment afterward takes that show you you know how you can go from one subject or one one point to another very very professionally i don't choose those i choose those awkward one you know those uh, hesitation so this is and this is very important because it's in a way it speaks about every image uh, as a now time you know uh, but most of the time uh, people forget that and they also forget that every image is a memory. So now time and memory are not contradicting each other. But the fact that um, people sometimes consider what is in front of them in the, on the screen as that's exactly what happened. You forget the now time. You know, so the time of consumption, the time of receiving, the time of projecting and so on. text don't stop in the dark uh, that refers to the ways of your filmmaking you have wrote remember the rules of night passage don't stop in the dark or you'll be lost move to, a, to the rhythm of your senses um, maybe in the process of filmmaking there are times of, of uh, certainty and times of confusion as in real life but um, maybe being lost is a good thing as long as we keep going, uh, but with other senses. What is the role of intuition in your filmmaking? 
unfortunately, you know, in the West, the word intuition is so often given to women and to uh, people, quote and unquote, uh, minority or primitive people, you know, people of the fourth world, they, they always readily give intuition. So people have a different kind of knowledge. I would say that they are, there's a diversity of um, ways of knowing and you have uh, very rational uh, knowledge, for example, but an analytical knowledge, but you can also have something that is in the realm of what people call wisdom, you know, so wisdom is a different kind of knowledge and intuition for me is a different kind of knowledge. And so <clears throat> rather than using the word uh, intuition, I would um, say what you have just said here, which is that it's, um, you have to, to rely on different ways of approaching whatever is around you rather than always trying to know uh, the meaning of something in a film, right? So uh, people go for meaning, what does this mean? Yeah, and um, it's not, uh, for example, you know, if they don't understand it, then your film is worth nothing. But if that is the case, then how do you, how do you advance in life, you know, when you don't have the lights on? For example, and here in California right now, you know, with all the fire alarms and they cut down our electricity. <laughs> you know, this is something that you have to learn even in a very urban context, right? You don't you don't wait until you are in that kind of situation. So but that's that's still very materially speaking. You know, this realm of the invisible is huge, large, and the realm of the unspeakable, as you said. You know, these are all these realms that coexist with the kind of reality that we know. But those, there are some of us who are, um, who pay attention to that realm and hence could uh, put out a lot of antennas, you know, enriching that realm. And then you have other people who are just only staying with the visible and the material and reject everything else, you know, that does not fit in there. And that's why there is constantly this, um, you know, this kind of domineering logic that people use in relation to people of the quote fourth world, or you know, indigenous people, for example, or minority people, or women, and so on. So that's why I, I, you know, whenever we use this term, we are always having to be very careful that we are not being put in a category immediately. So we have to. Talk, if we talk about knowledge, then we talk about different kinds of knowledge and different kind of approach and the way that we have been impoverished because we don't know different kind of approach and we are sticking only to one, thinking that this is the only way you know, to proceed. A journey in these villages may have a cathartic effect for a man seeing a hundred story building often gets conceited. There is also a way of viewing nature as a challenge to man's conquest, therefore of seeing in the smallness of man and woman a need for improvement. Ogo, the first who stood against God Amma, and introduced psychological diversification in the universe, was transformed into a fox and thus reduced to speaking only with its paws on the divination tables.
the figures are drawn on the smooth sand by the diviners before sunset. The fox which comes out at night is lured onto the tables by means of peanuts which the diviners have carefully scattered over them. The next day, the diviners will come back to the sunrise to read the traces left by the fox. Their interpretations vary according to the latter's itinerary, whose imprints may join, border, or avoid the figures. The divination table is the earth, turning under the action of the fox's legs. In this territory, the Mapuche people call Newen to the vital energy, and is uh, the word also for the fire of the heart. And also the Aymara and the Quechua people call it Chama. And I refer to this because you use the word sap uh, in a very similar way. Um, you, you have said to use an image is not only the shape of the flowers or the fruits or a plant, but what matters is the sap that runs through it. Uh, different words to name a kind of um, similar energy that is invisible. Uh, is it possible to film this? Or how do you recognize this while filming? Yeah, I, I really appreciate your giving me, you know, other names and other, you know, how, how other people from different parts of the world, you know, also approach that concept, right? Um, I think it's it's uh, the West always think in terms of uh, in relation to aesthetics, in terms of composition, in terms of uh, um, you know accordance and discordance and um, harmonizing things and so on. But um, the most important part, you know, these are like the shape of the flowers. But the most important part, and that's the part that I also point to when I said you cannot teach this is precisely this energy, you know, that you are mentioning. And I, I love the fact that you keep on coming back on this notion of energy, because for many people, energy is not very material. So they don't, they always want to know how can you feel the energy, but you do feel it. People feel it very strongly. And actually, you know, you can feel the vibes of someone. Um, you know, you, you can go next to someone and you can feel the vibes of that person or people who approach me, they are very far away and I can feel the vibes and I feel that they are going to come <laughs> close to me and, and so on, right? So you can feel this very strongly and it's the same thing with a work. Um, you don't simply read, for example, any of the theories that we love, you know, like uh, the, the trendy theories like Derrida or Foucault or, um, uh, you know, um, Deleuze, for example, you don't read them for what they say. I think you read them for what they say, which is what we all do, but I read them mainly to find out their spirit, how they approach the material. You know, so that spirit is not something that is visible, and yet it trans, it trans, um, how do you say, it comes out you know, in the, in the writing, in the thought that they offer, in the way that they put things together, in the way that they associate the different fields that they work with, you can, you can feel that very strongly. So when you understand the spirit of, of someone, the result is there and it's marvelous. But the more important aspect is that spirit. So I think it's, it's the same with a work, the Chinese and East Asian uh, people talk about the qi or the qi, you know, which is like the breath of a word. How do you receive the breath of the word? One of the way to receive that breath, you know, is uh, through rhythm. For me, uh, cinema is very much about rhythm. And um, 
you can come in a film and you immediately feel that the film has no rhythm. You know, it's not aware of its own walk. In other words, you know, the way it walks, it's not aware of it. You can feel that there's no rhythm in it. And then you come in other films, you know, and the rhythm is so strong. You can feel it right away. And for me, this is part of the chi, the, the, the breath, the breathing of the work. And also, you know, if you, let's say if you edit, and I, <laughs> right now, since I'm, um, you know, in a strange way, I'm on the uh, jury members of the Oscar, I'm seeing all these films, you know, that, um, that uh, begins with something very fast, very trendy. Okay, but, um, you know, it's uh, maybe the person didn't want to, to come in with something that is slow, that would put other people to sleep. So I would understand that. But when it goes on for more than 20 minutes, and then it's a film that totally lacked any sense of rhythm. You know, you just jam in things one after the other. And they jam in things according, especially in documentary, according to either the message or the, the story that I want to cover. So this is, for me, a very... Um, you know, it's like uh, only focusing on the on the shape of the flower and not even f smell the flower or feeling the energy of that flower that comes out. You know, in other parts of the world, they use flowers to to um, to receive the energy, you know, of the flower. So I think this notion of energy, the notion of breathing, the notion of the spirit of a word, is something that is very important. It's something that you you um, becomes, you are not naturally sensitive to it, but you become more and more sensitive to it because you are making film yourself or because you are doing something else yourself and you recognize that. To survive, spirituality would have to come to us from all the ordinary images of life. It is said that when Shakyamuni lost his ordinary sight, one branch of a plum tree blossom in the snow. The principle underlying Japanese cultural forms, says Nyozikan Hasegawa, is the control of feeling, a control ideally meant to intensify emotion without flooding the recipient. Bridge, train, passenger, what's in motion? Windows closed, muted soundtrack, no body movement, only the erotic rocking of human against machine. Landscape, image, wagon, viewer, what's moving in the midst of stillness? Traveling anew, with video images put online, displayed on screen. From one spectacle to the next, mobility of human sets, possession of window images, the landscape wired 
now glimpse, now no longer seen, morphing, changing, from one minute to the next. In your films, there are different ways of filming the everyday life. The, there are simple images, but very beautiful. Um, also very different depending on the country and its people. Uh, how do you approach everyday life in your films, uh, in your filmmaking? The everyday for me is, um, we tend to think of it as something that is routine, you know, that uh, every day you work, wake up and you do this and you do that. Uh, but, you know, if you remember a film like, um, uh, what is it, what is the title of Chantal Ackerman's film that, uh, about the, the, the four days that the woman, um, she just follow, but many of her film are that way, and she follow, follow day one, day two, day three, day four, and then um, you see her every day going through the same routine, and then suddenly um, she starts doing something that is different, right? Because we see the routine, when she does something different, we notice right away, you know? So it, the notion of duration in cinema, the notion of something that is routine becomes something that is very charged, very special. And this is how I see the everyday, that the everyday is something that you cannot control. You go out in the street and something happened and it already changed, you know, your everyday. So the everyday is something that you cannot hold, you cannot, control that you cannot simply repeat mindlessly, but something that has the appearance of repetition, but that is not, you know, um, mechanical uh, repetition, in other words. And so this everyday is something that the everyday can become, you know, as soon as you put a, a frame on it, it can become so charged. And it tells you, of course, how we receive the everyday, how we receive life, in other words and whether we receive it rhythmically, you know, uh, spiritually, <laughs> with spirits, for example, with um, chi, with energy, or whether we receive them deadly, you know, without any uh, intervention in it, without any action, without even feeling for it, without vib vibrating for it, that's all, you know, in the way that we receive the everyday. So this is very important for me. And I know that sometimes People see this film and they say, they use a word like travelogue. Um, you know, it's, it's a way, that's their way of approaching. And they say travelogue. But have you ever seen a travelogue, you know, um, reflecting on the everyday or um, giving you a reflexive dimension of non-human and human interaction or any of the things that you can find in my films, right? So these, why would they call it a, a travelogue? It's just mere habit, you know. Um, and also, you know, sometimes because people couldn't find the right word, you know, for the, the type of film, they would come up with something like travelogue. But for me, it has nothing to do with the travelogue. You know, um, you, can, you can travel all around the, 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 the country or you can stay in one place and focus on the everyday, for example. And uh, there is nothing of the travelogue that is in there except the notion that, you know, uh, we are in a way um, at the same time dwellers and travelers. You know, that there's no such opposition as the, the mobility of the traveler and the um, immobility, you know, of the, of the dweller. That's how people often come to other countries, uh, other cultures. They think that the, that culture is immobile. They are the one who come in and who are mobile. But actually, you know, they are, uh, they come to, uh, to this culture and these culture are changing within itself, you know, so there's a mobility within and there's a mobility across, they, there are many kinds of mobility and there are many kinds of immobility, you know, again, we come back to this notion of mountain and water, you know, <laughs> solidity and, and fluidity. So these are, you know, the, the aspect the richness, the wealth, you know, of the everyday that I brought in my work.
trong đầm gì đẹp bằng sen lá xanh bóng trắng lại chen nhị vàng nhị vàng bông trắng lá xanh gần bùng mà chẳng What is more beautiful than a lotus in a pond? Yellow stamens, white petals, green leaves, always near mud. It never smells of mud. In many of your films, there are dances and music, very powerful images, hypnotic images, but they also bring a reflection on the notion of freedom and the collective. In our capitalist societies, we have been told that, the, that individualism is supposed to be the maximum ex expression of freedom. But instead, in your films, you say that the endless demand of freedom is actually related, related to the collective. Mm -hmm. I guess um, uh, you are referring, uh, or at least one of the film that that would uh, we can take as example you know to discuss this point is the fourth dimension uh, <clears throat> the film that i shot in in japan and that's where i showed some of the funny scene where you know everybody talk about japanese culture as being the culture where uh, in tourism for example you would see a bus of japanese uh, you know, landing and then they come out all together, they click the camera together, they do a lot of things together as a collective. And of course they belong, you know, in their workplace, they belong to the corporation and they have this, um, you know, kind of belonging, that kind of ethical belonging that is very strong in the way that they work and so on. So because the film is shot in Japan, I was, thinking about all these uh, aspects, especially when I go to a place and I have uh, 30 other cameras around me shooting at the same time, right? And uh, all these people who are not professional and who are not making films, they have more professional uh, equipment than myself. I have small camera, but they have huge one and they bring in, they do things very professionally, right? So uh, I had to think about all these uh, aspects and of course all the, um, you know, the, the festivals that I encountered during that time that I was in, uh, in Japan show how the individual operate within the collective. So for me, you know, once in a while, you would see someone painting something, you know, um, clad exactly the same as other people. So just one among the collective, but then the person would uh, paint a smiley face, you know, on his, on his front. And when you see that, you just burst out laughing. Right? This is the small detail of individualism. But um, so freedom is not simply only, you know, an expression of individualism. You can be free within the collective. So the, the, the collective, for example, can be very oppressive. You know, sometimes uh, community can be so oppressive. Um, the pressure to be all the same is so oppressive, but at the same time, um, you know, individualism can also be very oppressive. Individualism, as people carry it out, like my with my freedom, I can just stumble on your feet, or I can just walk on your feet, or my freedom is mine and not yours, and so on. You know, this kind of freedom, individualistic freedom, which is in a way very characteristic of the West. Um, and uh, exactly what is happening in our in our country right now in the U.S., you know. So I think that this uh, individualism, it's a hoax to think of it as a freedom. It's really uh, misleading to think of it as, as freedom. This is like individualism in its most conventional aspect. So freedom that is not freedom, freedom that is claimed only if you can step on someone's toes, then uh, it's no freedom, you know, for anyone. So that's why I think the notion of collectivity and the notion of individuality have to be work in such a way, you know, that there is a kind of, um, there is not one that dominate the other. 
they, but there's a kind of tension between the two, you know, where the two are always acting on one another and keeping check of one another. Yeah. Um, um, maybe taking this idea of the collective uh, and knowing how important it is for the for cinema and its and its creation process. Uh, I remember I remember that you have say that you learned to 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 film uh, thanks to a group of friends. Um, so, in this sense, how is for you to to teach cinema, or or maybe teach is not the word, but rather. Uh, what do you share with your students? You know? Yeah, no, it, it's a, again, you know, it's a very important and crucial question. And uh, not so much about teaching, you know, but mm. uh, what is it in cinema, you know, that you would like to, to share, you know, with other people? And I think um, one, of the, one of the, first of all, you know, I write, I, um, teach at Berkeley in the Department of Rhetoric and Gender and Women's Studies. Uh, and rhetoric is just uh, a term, you know, for the different kind of discourses. So you can have political discourse, you can have uh, artistic or uh, cinematic or uh, dance, you can have anything, you know, in terms of discourse. And so film would be part of it. But I used to teach also in the film department. And uh, you can you can smile because I pull out from the film department. <laughs> I actually don't well. want to teach there anymore. <laughs> and before Berkeley, I taught you know at San Francisco State University, you know, and in the cinema department. Uh, so I was uh, three quarter time in cinema department and one quarter time in the art department. You know, so I have always been in more than one department, and they are all different. You know, and so for me, that's my approach to film, and that's what I, I can share with my students, that um, making a film is not only uh, getting images, you know, with, um, oh, I'm sorry, this. Uh... Yes. <laughs> um, so um, this is what I wanted to share with my with my students. You know the, the multiplicity of film. So it's not a, just a question of using a camera to obtain an image, and then after that put together this this image and so on. Um, there is no one among us who can cover everything that film film reality can offer. You know. So for example. Uh, you and I are doing some music. You, we are also doing uh, cinematography or in, and photography. And I'm a writer and I also write poetry and so on. So I pull together all of these aspects. And each one of us, you know, in a way, offer has something different to offer and to contribute to cinema. And this is what um, is most important, not a mere a simple approach not a one approach, institutionalized approach to film, but rather this multiplicity of possibilities and richness. And of course, um, you know, when I, it's not the easy to teach that way. And of, I have had students who really agonize with me the whole semester. <laughs> but uh, by the end of the semester, it's like they realize what I was doing and the year after, when they don't have me anymore, they go on to another teacher. They are all coming back to me and said, Mina, what are you going to do if you, are, if you have to, let's say, write a, a script before you make a film and so on? They always come back to you afterwards because uh, what you are interested in is not to make them follow certain rules of cinema. These you can always learn. And now with the... Uh, you know, with all the information online, you really can learn all of that online. But the part that you cannot learn and that is not online is precisely how to bring out 
the, the, the force, the strength of each of the people who come to film, their own wealth, you know, what they have to offer. And most of the time they haven't asked that question. So as a teacher, you are simply facilitating, asking questions or pushing them in certain dire direction so that they can, um, you know, discover, in other words, their own talents. Interview, an antiquated device of documentary. Truth is selected, renewed, displaced, and speech is always tactical. So how many interviews in the overall? Whom do you choose? In one case, 150 interviews were made for the film. Five were retained in the final version. What criteria? Age, profession, economical situation, cultural regions, north, south and center, critical ability, personal affinity. Spoken, transcribed and translated. From listening to recording, speech to writing. You can talk, we can cut, trim, tidy up. The game often demands a response to the content rarely to the way that content is framed. Spoken and read, between a language of inwardness and that of pure surface. Dear sister, there was something particularly pleasurable in going to an ice cream place to enjoy a drink in Vietnam. I feel no such excitement here, where ice cream shops have no ambience. To find such pleasure again, one has to go all the way to Houston Texas or Santa Ana, California, where Vietnamese communities form their own towns and villages. It sounds like getting old and outdated. The pose is always present, and accidents on film are known as controlled accidents. The more intimate the tone, the more successful the interview. Every question she and I come up with is more or less a copy of a question we have heard before. Even if the statement is original, it sounds familiar, warm, threadbare. By choosing the most direct and spontaneous form of voicing and documenting, I find myself closer to fiction. We know that you are working on a new film right now. You are editing a new film. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to ask you if you can share with us uh, something about the process of this new work, uh, how it has been for you uh, in this new context, in this uh, pandemic context. Um, what can you share with us? You know, I must say that um, I have six projects, film projects, and I was too busy with uh, work at the university and everything else, you know, writing and traveling. So I haven't been able to really sit down to ask for funding, you know, for this film, even though people told me you can apply here and there and so on. But also because um, of the kind of film that I do, it's difficult to find funding in any case. So I have all these projects that are pending and it was thanks to you know, one of the creators who knew my work, Ute uh, Metabauer, she actually wanted it. Uh, she's organizing a retrospective in Singapore and she really wants it for the exhibition. And I said, there's no way that I can finish a whole film, you know, for that deadline. But she said, oh, just 20 minutes. And at first I was very resistant because I, that's not the way I work, you know, just doing like some kind of trailer or or a pilot film, that's not the way I work when I work, it's the whole thing that comes in. But then, you know, I understand that you have to be flexible, you know, with funding situation, uh, the funders want to see something of a film and so on. So I started and I made, you know, so far I've made something like 56 minutes of the film that she's exhibiting in Singapore. And I call it part one of um, a film that is tentatively uh, title, What About China? You know, so um, 
of course, the first reality, you know, that I have to face in doing this is that it's a film that I shot in 93, 94. And um, already, you know, for people, oh, it's not current, you know, um, yes, but as I said, every image that you see in film is an image of memory. So, you know, what is it? You know, the, of course, there are changes that happen, but it's like the form of the flowers, right? The, they are, the forms of the flowers change all the time. But that energy, that now time, that um, spirit, you know, of the world is, and spirit of a people, of a country, is something, you know, that is much more, um, how, how, how should I say, enduring, you know, than some of these little changes around, right? So this is my approach, you know, to, to that film, 93, 94. And of course, I shot it at the time, you know, in nothing like HD or 4K today. So you can imagine the problem that I have today using that footage um, just to work with uh, whether the sound mixer or the color timer or anything, it was hell. You know, because we do it um, uh, not in person, we did it online, you know, but also because this, uh, the system of, let's say, Da Vinci uh, does not work with the system of Final Cut Pro 10, and this does not work with that. Oh, you can't believe the, um, the uh, problem that I raised in uh, forgetting Vietnam, you know, with the two different technology, low and high. It's like multiply by 10 by now. You know, of course the gap is bigger, 93 and then now with the technology now, but it tells us so much about the, our society and the way that we deal with technology, with new technology. We think, uh, you know, everything is done so that everything that comes out in a later phase would exclude or would um, make the, the older one, not compatible. So incompatibility is like the main term around new technology for me. <laughs> it's like you can't have the old and the new. It's uh, totally out of question. And when, when you try to work with uh, people, people just laugh at you. They said, what do you expect? You know, if you bring in this old technology, of course we can't do it. But of course we can do it because you know, uh, with persistence, I did succeed to do my 50 <laughs> so far, you know, the 56 minute and so on. So that's another aspect that comes in with the film, you know, and the third aspect is uh, <clears throat> the pandemic, you know, of course, that, that I already raised, how you work in isolation and you work in utter isolation. It becomes a one, you know, um, every technical aspect that I, when you do a feature length film, it's a collective work, as you said. And we ask a number of people and here, you know, I have to work with musicians, um, totally not in person, but uh, long distance. And then um, seeing that I want to shoot in calligraphy, I couldn't do it so far, you know, so I have to come up with other ways to do it. And of course, the different kind of music, the different, kind of voices, you know, the voice, you cannot really uh, direct the voice, you can do it approximately, but so how to, to deal with all this problem is something that, uh, you know, that leads me also in this film to what you will be seeing when, when it's going to be finished. <laughs> to compare revolutionaries who fought hard to overthrow feudal power but remain skeptical vis-a-vis -vis his line of socialism to the legendary Lord Shi, a dragon lover who collected pictures and statues of dragons with passion but was said to have fled in a panic when the live dragon came down the road. A peasant said it all. Politics is just beating air with air. 
Confucius also knew what he did when he said, I saw a dragon today. It condenses into an entity and disperses into nothing. It rides on clouds, appears and disappears. In Chile, a year ago, there was a huge social revolt. And for months, many people took the streets uh, for social demands. And many things happened during the riots, uh, where the only flag that was raised was the one of the Mapuche nation. But it was particularly impressive. And what happened for the first time in our history, uh, that the statues and the memorials of the Spanish colonizers were turned down and burned. What do you think is the place of cinema uh, in its political approach in denying an image, uh, but bringing up new ones in terms of colonialism and film? Yeah, no, I know that it's, um, it's a very debatable, right, controversial subject in relation to all the statues. And here in Berkeley, you know, some of the, um, uh, the students have, uh, demand you know that the uh, administration changes the name of some of the of the buildings and uh, it has been many years and now finally you know they changed the name because of these names were uh, related with uh, colonial enterprise and so on so i think changing image that's the first step <laughs> And the other, the other very nice point that you raise is um, how the flags and so on, they're not so much divided into parties, but other ways, you know, for example, of dealing. We can talk about notion of alliances and alliances not between people who share the same, exactly the same ideology, but alliances in difference, you know, so, um, and I mentioned here the example of women, uh, the Women's March, and also <clears throat> what happened, for example, with uh, the situation in Japan, when there was this huge um, uh, wave, you know, tide wave that came in, and uh, with, the, with the question of uh, nuclear, <clears throat> the nuclear uh, station and so on. Well, um, for the first time, the uh, leading you know, leading um, protesters are grassroots women, but it's a wide alliances that come together in terms of climate change, in terms of uh, uh, social, you know, uh, protests and social resistance and so on. There are many, many factions that come together with the, the question of alliances. So something that we can bring to, we can act on both on a very collective and very individual, you know, um, individual, uh, how do you say, individual uh, uh, scale, because look at Tibet, you know, and how they, um, they uh, change every act or the act of every day to a political act. Like they decide at 8 p.m. on the day of the Olympics, at 8 p.m., everybody turned off the light for an hour, you know, or they decide, for example, to go <clears throat> um, to use, you know, this um, spiritual walking around, you know, uh, circumambulating around. They use it as a political uh, venues. You know, the, the more they do it, of course, in appearance, it's exactly the same. You are just walking around. But the fact that so many people come together and doing that together. And then every Wednesday, all around the world, uh, Tibetans are um, consuming only Tibetan products, 
you know, whether it is vegetables or, um, or anything else, you know, you buy Tibetan and you speak Tibetan. So for me, these are the forms, you know, and of course, changing the image is a step forward. I think it's, it's, uh, it's the beginning of something different rather than simply constantly um, using this left and right, left and right, you know, partisanship. You are bringing in other ways, you know, of dealing with politics. And well, let's hope, you know, that uh, one of the things when you look at all the, the films made by women, and I still remember, um, you know, someone, um, actually an independent filmmaker whose name I'm not going to mention, but he, when he saw my film, he said, this is so, uh, he had never seen film where there is so much gentleness, you know, in, in the image. And that was about Sune Viet Givning Nam. And, and yes, no, women came up with products that even though you can criticize strongly, profoundly, and to the core, you know, a system, you are not using violence, you know, to do that. And we are using other tools, other ways, you know, of dealing with it. And people come in, they get upset about the film, they say this and say that. But still, you know, someone else see that there's a lot of gentleness, right, in that film. So for me, that's something that is very nice. And I must share with you as an ending note that um, I'm very glad, you know, that uh, to have this conversation with you and with uh, Roberto, because um, so far I have refused all the, <laughs> all the Zoom talk, except for the retrospective of my film, but I refuse everything because um, the Zoom mode of interaction is not exciting. I, I think it's uh, something that we, we do because of the pandemic, but of course being sharing with the audience is something that is so much nicer. But I really appreciate, you know, your actually continuing on this work um, during the pandemic time. And then also it uh, bring back, brings back a very nice memory for me that my film Ressemblage that get, got attacked, you know, by all kinds of people and all kinds of media, actually one of the most uh, insightful common that I get from it came from uh, a man who is from Chile. You know, he told me after he saw the film, he said, oh, this film is looking like a deer. You know, it's uh, the way that it looks, looks at uh, ima the is image come in, it's looking like a deer. And I thought, oh, how wonderful. You know, this is the like um, a gift so big, you know, you don't have to look in front of you or this way or that way. You can look like a deer, you know, because deer have eyes on the side, you know, and they can look differently, you know, for example. And I thought it was so beautiful, you know, this, this kind of reaction, you know, to the film rather than trying to come up with uh, what it means and all this kind of thing. He immediately understand that uh, there is a difference that is operating and he calls it, you know, it looks like, like a deer. So for me, you know, um, having the film shown to the Chilean audience, audience, I'm very happy. And I wish you the best success also with the continuation of this uh, festival. Yeah. Para 
todas sus comunidades que podrá observarla por las redes sociales. Desde el 18 al 30 de enero del 2021 por Arica 2.cl.